listening to the Caffeinated Thoughts Podcast. Hi, this is Shane Vanderhart. Welcome back to another episode. Uh, this week, as I'm sure you could imagine, we're going to be talking about the midterms elections um, and providing some analysis about what happened on Tuesday night. Uh, I had a conversation with Terry Schilling, the executive director with American Principles Project, and full disclosure, also one of our sponsors, or the sponsor for this podcast. Uh, so he and I talk about the potential Trump effect, the realignment of, of voters um, you know, nationally, and, and basically his view of what happened uh, on Tuesday night. And then uh, my daughter, Calvi Vanderhart, comes on. She's, been a, she's a contributor to Caffeinated Thoughts. Uh, has been on my radio pro been on the radio program and we had that a, a couple different times. Uh, has written for uh, several different publications and not only my own, but uh, we we break down um, the congressional the congressional uh, elections here in Iowa as well some state house uh, races. So you know just sit tight and uh, before we get to all that, first a word from our sponsor. At American Principles Project, we believe that human dignity should be at the heart of public policy. We work in all 50 states and in Washington, D.C. to promote life, religious freedom, local control over education, authentic economic progress for working Americans, and a return to constitutional principles such as federalism. Want to help American Principles Project? Visit our website today, AmericanPrinciplesProject.org. That's American Principles, P L E S, project.org. Sign up for email updates. Help us out. We want to work with you. That's American Principles Project.org. And here's my conversation with Terry Schilling, Executive Director of American Principles Project. So, hey, welcome to the Caffeinated Thoughts podcast, Terry. Um, always good to have you on. I think this is like. Maybe yeah, second. thanks for having me, Shane. <laughs> I think second time I've had you on the podcast and probably third time I think we've talked because I think you were on the radio program once when we were on the radio. Yep. Uh, so what what are your initial thoughts about uh, midterms last night? Overall, I think it was a victory for Republicans. Uh, and it definitely wasn't the blue wave that Democrats had been promising us. Uh, if you look at the map, we picked up, I think, around three – uh, seats uh, for the Senate. We'll see how these last few races play out with the with the results that they're still tallying. Uh, but on the House side, you know, it's, it's a really a mixed bag because you had all these uh, incumbents retire. You had 46 uh, retirements in the House. And on top of that, you had four states that had their judiciary uh, branches uh, require them to redraw the maps. And had those two things not happened, I think we'd be talking about how Trump and the Republicans retained uh, both uh, uh, branches of, uh, I'm sorry, both both parts of Congress. Um, so overall, okay. I think it was a, a mixed bag, but overall positive for Republicans. Okay. Uh, in Iowa, I know it was uh, positive at the state level uh, because we, uh, they realized, got Republicans saw their governor reelected, uh, Kim Reynolds, and then uh, uh, they kept control of the Iowa House. They kept control and actually expanded the majority in the Iowa Senate. Um, federally, though, <laughs> it was a disaster for Republicans uh, because two of their incumbent uh, congressmen, uh, uh, Rod Blum and David Young, both lost re-election. Um, un unfortunately, we can't, you know, Republicans can't point to to uh, you know, re redistricting or retirements in that instance. Um, so it, it, I'm just so I, I think there was probably a little bit more going on than just that. I think it probably it probably varied district by district anyway. Yeah, well, the other thing I had an interview this morning um, with a group in London actually, and they asked me, uh, you know, what happened with Trump and why is he losing these uh, suburban areas? And I mm -hmm. think it's a mistake to act like Trump hasn't changed uh, the uh, coalition of both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. He's totally right. turned them both on their heads. He is – he's not just expelling people from the Republican Party. He's also bringing people in. The coalition okay. is changing. The Republican Party is getting more working class. 
although it has been working class for a long time, but we're trying, starting to get a lot of those working class people uh, from uh, the Democratic Party uh, who believe in American greatness, who believe in American exceptionalism. You know, they go to church on Sunday. They don't like to kill babies. They like to hunt. So we're getting those guys in the Democratic Party to switch over to us. But we're losing these suburban uh, districts and these suburban women uh, because they, they're probably not uh, okay with uh, some of the uh, tactics that Trump has used politically through the media um, and through his Twitter or whatever. Um, so he is changing the coalition and the makeup of the Republican Party. But I think overall it's a, it's a more effective and a, a better uh, party politically going into 2020. Okay. Well, is, is there what, what could be done to – to you know, possibly reach out to some of these suburban areas since we're in one because I know in Iowa in Iowa District Three anyway, uh, Congressman Young really needs suburbs to go for him. I mean that's the reason he he won every other county in the in the in the Iowa Third District except Polk County and which isn't unusual. He normally loses Polk County, but he he won it by he lost it by such a, a wide margin it totally you know overwhelmed everything else. So. Um, so in some areas that's probably will work, but in others I think there still needs to be an outreach to to suburban women. How do you think we can Republicans can overcome that? Well, I'd offer two solutions. Uh, I'd offer them to uh, change their economic messaging to be much more focused on working class families. Donald Trump ran a great campaign in 2016, speaking to those working families and how he was going to make their lives better. Um, however. When we passed the tax cuts, a lot of the rhetoric on it was about how they were all geared towards helping the rich. And the mainstream media helped out of this quite a bit, too, um, and how we were cutting the corporate tax rate from 35 or 39% to 20%. Uh, but there wasn't as much focus and talk by Republicans. We just got out message. We got out work. Uh, we should have been talking more about the benefits that were included in the tax package for working families. And I think that if you want to win those suburban women over, if you want to win uh, more of these people that have been leaving the Republican Party, we need to talk more to that aspect. Republicans still have this uh, reputation for being a party of, you know, rich white guys uh, and big business. Right. And we're not. We never have been. Uh, we just have a mainstream media that's, you know, against us. Um, you know, so I think if he starts talking more Trump and the Republicans, if they start addressing more of the economic concerns of working families, uh, I think it'll fare a lot better in these suburban areas. The second thing, and I think this is probably more important than anything, uh, is to be bold. Be bold on all of your positions, including key social issues like the right to life, religious freedom, uh, and our ability to raise our children. You know, the Democrats are waging this war on families' ability to direct the upbringing of their children. They want to force these radical curriculums in schools. They want to teach children that gender is fluid. They're bringing in, you know, drag queen story hours into second grades now. Um, and Republicans should fight that and fight it hard because a lot of these voters that have, you know, left the Republican Party over harsh rhetoric would be even more shocked and dismayed at, the, at this type of harsh rhetoric that's being directed at our children to mislead them into these alternative and troubling lifestyles. That's true. One of the things in Iowa's governor race anyway, and that's what, obviously what I focused mostly on, uh, that one of the things that, that surprised me that uh, Republicans off the bat didn't really focus on with Fred Hubble, the Democratic challenger, was that he was the CEO of Planned Parenthood. For, or not CEO, chairman of, of the board of Planned Parenthood for a time back in, I think, the early 90s. And, and that, I mean, it was like crickets until it finally came up in the debate, and then they finally talked about it, that abortion was not something Republicans talked about, but it was something that Democrats talked about. So, and unfortunately, when you let one party talks about it and the other one doesn't, then the party that's talking about it frames the debate. Um, which, exactly. you know, of course, of course, then it was like, all, oh, hey, you know, your women are losing access to health care, you know, and why do you, why do you think Republicans shy away from that, that topic? Uh, why? I think that they're just uncomfortable with it. You know, it's, it's constantly repeated to them through the media when they're getting interviewed and by their opponents that, Social issues are divisive. Social issues are a loser for women and minorities. When in fact, the reality is, is that women and Hispanics and young people 
are all very supportive of the current measures, the current pro-life measures being proposed in Congress. I don't know if you've looked at the numbers. I'm sure you have, Shane. You're, you, you do this all the time. But the numbers on the 20-week bill banning abortion in the fifth month when the child can feel pain is astronomical. It's even better with women than it is with right. men. Uh, it's around 67% of women oppose abortion after 20 weeks and would support a 20-week ban. So I, I think there's just a lot of misconception. But the other big thing uh, that I think is the problem with Republicans is they have this, you know, James Carville, uh, when he was working for Bill Clinton, said a famous line, it's the economy, stupid. we got to talk about the economy. Well, you only campaign on the economy when it's bad. <laughs> when people are losing their jobs, right. they're losing their income, that's when it's a concern for voters and a, and a voting issue for them. But fortunately for Trump uh, and for Republicans, they've done a pretty good job of turning the economy around. Jobs are being created left and right. The, the stock market is through the roof. Things are going very well in the economy. Voters okay. aren't going to vote on it when their job isn't in question. And so they have to be prepared to defend themselves and the economy. But what's really happening right now is there's a cultural fight between progressives, which are really the elite class in this country and the people mm -hmm. and they need to side with the people because it's not rocket science right you know right lots of there are lots of dads and moms out there for example on the on the gender identity stuff who don't want biological boys showering and using the same locker room facilities as their daughters it's just common sense but the elites uh, are pushing this on us. And Republicans have a decision to make. Are we going to side with a small group of elites pushing a radical agenda? Or are we going to side with everyday Americans who are concerned about what their children are experiencing at school? Okay. Well, I know looking at having a brief look at exit polling, um, you know, health care came up, immigration came up, Kavanaugh came up, um, which how, how, how big an impact do you think Kavanaugh made um, in, in Senate elections? I think that Kavanaugh had a big impact uh, early on and helped kill a lot of the momentum from or for the Democrats. Um, I think, though, I wish it would have happened closer to the election um, to where people were still hot on it um, and how, just how unfairly he was treated. Uh, you know, it was just – it was irredeemable it, the, the, what they accused him of. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, after all these accusations were thrown out, painting him as this evil man, two of his accusers have already admitted that they made up their stories and that it wasn't him. Um, so I do think that the Kavanaugh thing made a difference. Um, and the health care thing is interesting because Republicans failed to deliver on that promise. And so how many right. of those people that were voting on health care were voting uh, to send a message to Republicans to actually repeal Obamacare and get it done. Uh, but, you know, there were a lot of Republicans that lost yesterday um, that were not that helpful when it came to uh, getting the job done on health care. That's true. Uh, immigration, do you think that's really that much of a, a hot ticket issue for, uh, for members of the House? Because it seems like I don't know the people I, I the people that lost didn't necessarily see at least in Iowa anyway uh, with Young and and Blum certainly they talked about it but unlike Congressman King who's in an incredibly safe district but he actually had a closer race than he probably should have um, you know it, it, it's not their driving issue so do you think immigration is something that's really you know driving people to the polls? I think that it's it's a small portion of the electorate. Um, however, I do think, though, that the immigration issue has become a bigger electoral issue uh, over the last few years. I think that Americans just want something commonsensical, and they don't want something radical. They don't want to deport everyone, but you know what they do want more than anything? They want assimilation. Uh, they don't want people coming here illegally and living in you know, little ghettos, essentially, where they're not integrating into our our country. You know, the assimilation is by far and large the most important part of immigration. And that's where Republicans can start winning again against the Democrats, because the Democrats aren't concerned about assimilation. In fact, they would prefer that they not assimilate, because guess what? They consider that a cultural appropriation. Um, 
they want us divided. They don't want us united as a country. And so Republicans, they should talk about border security, but they should also talk about the one area where Democrats will never go, which is assimilation, and stressing the importance of that. It'll make them, you know, it, it, it portrays that they are sincere and honest and, and actually searching for a good solution and concerned about the right things rather than, you know, being, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, invaded or something. In terms of candidate recruitment, from a national perspective, I mean, what are, are you seeing? It seems like in, in, in some areas the candidates are, you know, in the Democratic candidates are going further to the left. Um, it seems like uh, their, their candidate selection was good in some districts, but not so much in others. Like now I'm thinking Kentucky 6, um, where the, the the Democratic challenge, I can't think of her name off the top of my head, but she basically said, I wanted to be the most progressive person in Kentucky, which I can't believe that <laughs> resonates, you know, with, with yeah. maybe, you know, the uh, person who is a swing voter in Kentucky is like, eh, I, I'm willing to vote Democrat, but man, I don't know if I want that. Um, so uh, what, what are you seeing nationally with, with candidates? I mean, are we seeing more, more fringe candidates on the right and the left, uh, you know, run in these congressional districts? No, I, I mean, yeah, you're going to see more fringe candidates. I mean, you have, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez running, and right. obviously she's a real radical. Um, but, I, you know, I, I actually have to tip my hat to the Democrats. They did an exceptional job of recruiting candidates this year, uh, candidates that could, you know, speak well, not come across as crazy, uh, and also a lot of them were military, had military backgrounds. A lot of them, like right. there was a woman that run again, ran against Judge John Carter in Texas. She was a strong candidate, you know, an uh, ex-military woman. Um, those are the type of candidates that Democrats like to put up. Uh, Connor Lamb, I mean, they basically crafted him in a, in a political laboratory, I think. Uh, but they, I think they did a really good job of, uh, of recruiting candidates this year, a better job than we did. Um, you know, I, I, I just I think that they just did a better job recruiting candidates than we did, but we can do better. Okay. Hey, final thoughts before I let you go? Yeah, I think that 2020 is going to be a great year. I think that Donald Trump uh, thrives when he has an opponent and someone to uh, contrast himself with, and I think that Nancy Pelosi as Speaker uh, will be a great person to uh, contrast himself with um, and to point to as to why his agenda isn't getting fulfilled to voters. I think the Democrats are going to have a crazy horse race on their side, um, and I have no idea who they're going to choose, but it'll be interesting, that's for sure. Yeah, I have a feeling it's probably – it could – she's got to she got to do a lot of convincing with some of these new members because a number of them were critical of her, you know, in their, in their campaigns. And then I think there's some old guard that may not necessarily support her being speaker either. So I – Definitely not a done deal that she's going to be speaker. So, but uh, yeah. I think her being speaker does would help Republicans um, in 2020. Definitely. So, hey, Terry, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me, Shane. I'll come back anytime. Uh, okay, take care. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Here's my conversation with Kelvy Vanderhart, my eldest daughter, and contribute contributor to Caffeinated Thoughts. Well, I am joined uh, by my daughter, Kelby, which is a, I think this is the first time you've been on the podcast. You've been on our radio show before. So welcome to the Caffeinated Thoughts podcast, Kelby. Hey, thanks. So what do you think about last night? Uh, I guess it'll be Tuesday night. This will go out tomorrow. So it'll be Tuesday night now. We're talking Wednesday evening. Talking Wednesday evening. So my thoughts aren't caffeinated tonight. Um, which is unfortunate, but I still have them about the election. Um, so, I mean, right now I'm in Missouri. I uh, moved to Kansas City, but um, being so invested in the Iowa political scene, um, I definitely was hitting refresh on uh, results pages coming in last night. Um, mm-hmm. I think my first thought is I am relieved about Kim Reynolds. Um mm-hmm watching those final results roll in. I think my neighbors probably thought I was watching a football game um, very yeah. late on a Tuesday night because uh, I just kept finding myself cheering. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful about that. I mean, she's been doing an excellent job. 
um, of just keeping Iowa moving forward economically. Um, I mean, and that's that's obvious, the attention it's garnered across the country. Um, I am extremely disappointed that Iowa's congressional first district would elect Abby Finkenauer, though. That is so, – that is – so, so you think Abby's just a special person, and no, so, uh, you have some oh. personal experience with Abby, uh, who is state I representative, <laughs> now congress, congression, uh, congress, congresswoman, uh, elect Abby Finkenauer. So, tell, uh, what's your experience with Abby been like? Oh, absolutely. So, yes, unfortunately, I have two legislative sessions worth of experience with. Abby Finkenauer. Um, I was the um, I was a clerk for a Republican state representative in the state house for two years, um, and I had the pleasure of sitting just a couple of rows behind her. So Abby's policy positions have been fairly evident, or her lack thereof, uh, when you watch videos of her fumbling her way around questions, um, not able to answer, you know, answer directly, which is um, rem- it makes me reminisce, you know, of moments in the state house. Uh, however, I think, uh, aside from her policy, this this was so disappointing to me because um, Abby genuinely does not have a personality. Um, genuinely does not act like somebody who should be a public servant. I watched her time and time again be late to things, miss meetings, misprioritize. Um, she treated her personal assistant, so the person who served in the same role I did with my representative, that poor girl was running everywhere, doing every little thing. She treated her like a valet. Um, I have never seen such entitled behavior. Um, and it was unfortunate, too, because it wasn't it wasn't a partisan thing. It wasn't just, oh, Republicans didn't like her because she was Abby Finkenauer and, you know, with some hot shot of the Democratic Party. It was even people in her own party didn't like her. I remember um, speaking <laughs> speaking with some Democratic reps and their clerks, and I remember just the the horror kind of shining dimly in their eyes as uh, they commented on Abby being the future of the party. And you could see how upset even they were, um, the people who agreed with her policies. So. Uh, it's unfortunate to me that the people of the Congressional First uh, think that she's worthy of, you know, being in Congress. But at least now the rest of the United States will <laughs> understand what I, um, what I've grown to learn about Abby, and that she really, uh, you know, the the left likes to hold the title of nasty woman as some type of compliment, but I think she wears it quite well. Right. Well, and I don't have any personal experience with her, so I'm just gonna have be to, lucky. You know, be lucky. Yeah. <laughs> take take your word for it. Uh, people have to understand with Iowa Congressional First, it's always been a district in flux. I mean, uh, that was Bruce Braley's district for a number of years, and, and it's and, and even today, uh, you, you know, for even since since Congressman Blum took office, uh, there's always been more dem- registered Democrats than Republicans. Um, Con- Congressman Blum has relied upon the independent vote, so. It was really a perfect storm, I think. This this particular uh, 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 cycle, he, he his congressional seat was the one in Iowa I worried about the most mm-hmm. because because I knew it wasn't going to take a whole lot. Um, it, if women suddenly you know uh, turn against him even greater numbers, if independents you know turn against him, it, it didn't take a whole lot to flip that district really. Um, right. And and Absolutely. he's he, yeah. So um, in a midterm election with a Republican president, historically midterms always tend to go against the party that controls the the, the White House. So that already put him in a in a difficult position, just just based on the demographics of his district. Uh, but then turnout for Democrats was really good. I mean. Uh, Iowa Secretary of State's office announced that this is actually a record-breaking midterm mm-hmm. turnout. So uh, Democrats in that district were energized. There was tons of out-of-state money poured into that Absolutely. district, uh, opposed to, to Rob Blum as well as, as in support of of Abby Finkenauer. 
I thought and, it was very interesting tracing tracing those yeah. contributions to our campaign. Right, and you know, uh, um, I one thing uh, Blum also had a couple of ethics investigations opened up against him. That certainly didn't mm -hmm. help. That helped set up a no. narrative. So, it, it, I mean, it was just a perfect storm. So, uh, it, it I wasn't surprised by the polling and. I know there were people that were holding on to hope that he was going to pull it out, but I'm like, you'd have to have some major, major polling inconsistencies for him to have been able to pull out a victory on election night. I mean, it just, it wasn't going to happen. Um, so it, it, for a while, it seemed initially after the Kavanaugh here, or the Kavanaugh debacle, it looks like, you know, it looked like he was going to possibly get breathe new life, but, um, but the NRCC actually pulled out. Uh, of 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 that district or not that uh, mm -hmm. house majority fund house majority fund right pulled out and then they went back in briefly so they thought oh there's a mm -hmm. chance but initially they thought this is this is not a this can't be a priority because this is a lost district right um, so, it really didn't was, help it didn't help that this I feel like maybe more so than the in, in my short in my short lifespan you know I've only I've only witnessed, um, you know, a couple a couple of elections that I was actually involved in, but it just the abundance of identity politics in this um, in this election, you know, in reaction to President Trump, I think set Abby up perfectly because she's already been riding on the recognition of being, the, I believe, the third youngest uh, female state representative in the country. Uh, she was able to get out there and just push the I'm, you know, a hardworking woman for the for the eastern, for uh, Iowans in, in the eastern side of the state, and I'll represent you well in D.C., and um, mm -hmm. no really fact-checking was needed. Um, and uh, so I think that that really played in her favor, um, which has been disheartening to see. Uh, it is, I you know, clearly don't vote, don't vote based on identity, vote on right. philosophy and policy, but it is, it is cool to see, even if you disagree with somebody, see something historical happen. Um, but it's been disheartening watching uh, such a one-sided historical reporting from last night. And I, Abby was right. just another part of that. Right. And, you know, I, I, I haven't had a chance to really look in depth into the district and compare county numbers to 2014 to uh, when he first won to today. I. You could look, 2016, you gotta have to kind of take out of that, take, you know, not even look at that since that was a presidential election year. Uh, so you're not comparing apples to apples. But, uh, you know, I, I noticed that first, first of all, in Cedar Falls in Blackhawk County, uh, Walt Rogers uh, lost uh, House District 60. That had, wow. he, had, he had historically, since being elected, he's actually had some fairly easy elections. Uh, makes right. me wonder. I, I I don't I don't know this for certain, but it makes me wonder um, what kind of what kind of voter uh, get out the vote uh, efforts there were there was at University of Northern Iowa that would have probably helped sink him. Um, I also look at at I Lynn, think. yeah Lynn County, um, House District 68, which was Ken Riser. He retired. That actually, I think that district was starting to trend. It was already a close district anyway, but it was starting to trend Democrat. Um, but Lynn County also had good turnout. It went almost entirely blue except for one house district. Uh, so that, you know, those things didn't help because, you know, that obviously impacts the top, you know, towards the top of the ballot as well. So uh, that certainly right. didn't help. That didn't help, uh, you know, uh, Congressman Blum. Um, Dubuque, I don't even know, I don't think he normally, he hasn't won Dubuque County, but I, I think Finkenauer uh, had a, had a greater, you know, margin of victory in Dubuque County than, than he's experienced, well, they experienced in 2014 right. as well. Looking so. at that side of the state too, I was noticing in a couple of house districts, specifically uh, District 97 with Norlin Mumson, he's had mm -hmm. not, uh, not hard candidates to beat the past couple of years. I mean, he's, but this was a much closer margin this time around um, than I was used to seeing in that district. And so I think that that definitely, that get out the vote movement, which I wish conservatives and libertarians were better about, um, you know, that strategic really 
I think that there are some groups that are really good at that and some groups that aren't, but I definitely think that that helps play in Abby's favor as well. Right. And I think, uh, too, uh, there was a great, you know, back to, to women as well. I think that you have the Trump effect that impacted Congressman Blum negatively. Um, President Trump didn't win um, the the first congressional district by a, a, a wide margin. I think it was, in fact, actually, did he even win it at all? I th yeah, he did win it, I think, it, but it was under five points. I mean, it was pretty close. Um, so, and Congressman Blum actually outperformed President Trump in 2016 in the district. But when you right. have when you have women turning in greater margins, turning away from Trump that may have voted Republican in the past, but are voting in a, in a protest vote against Trump that that in a district like first, you know, the first congressional district, it's going to make an impact. So, um, right. I mean, there is that, like you mentioned earlier, the historical precedent for losing House seats after after a right. general election. However, I was looking at comparing the numbers between Obama and Trump, and the difference is uh, kind of impressive. Uh, Obama lost, you know, up above 60 seats, and I believe Trump, uh, since he's come into office, the uh, the loss was about, I think it was 26. I was looking at uh, 28 now so, in the House. So 28 yeah, now. That, yeah, yeah, 28 now, according to Real Clear Politics. Uh, so. Yeah, it, it wasn't, I mean, it, it, last night was just, or not last, no, well, last night, but election night was just weird. It was kind of what I think a lot of people are expect. I know I was, I was thinking it was going to be a very a likelihood that Republicans lost the House, but actually expanded their majority in the Senate based on the, on the election map. Um, and obviously that's what we saw. We got they well, had a pickup. Look of, at you. You should go into polling. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I mean, I obviously wasn't the only one that thought that, but I mean, yeah, right. the, the, the national preference polling, when it comes to who you'd rather see control the house, I mean, it was trending, you know, against Republicans in a wide, by a wide margin that had, that had mm -hmm. closed, closed after a while, for a while, but then it started to expand again. Um, so it, but so there wasn't a, a blue wave per se, but it definitely, it, I think this is a, more of a typical good midterm election for the opposition party. Um, so I, I you agree. know, because uh, if it was a wave, they would have taken back the Senate, they would have taken back more governorships. Um, you know, right. obviously, in go governorships, governorships, you know, we, uh, uh, Scott Walker lost, which is unfortunate. Scott Walker, but he, which, I mean, I think that that wasn't, that was a huge surprise, but. Um, oh, yeah, he knew Scott it was going to be, that that one was going to be really close. And he, you know, he, right. he was trying to sound the alarm on that. And Wisconsin, mm -hmm. you know, historically has been Democrat. And so, but people try, you know, have been th over the last you know, eight years have thought, oh, this, uh, Wisconsin's red. Well, no, they're, they've always been, they've always had, you know, historically have been blue, but they had trended red, but it was, it, you know, that, that, that's not set in stone. That could go back and it did. And I don't know, I don't know what happened with their, uh, with their state legislative races, but uh, it was disappointing to see. Uh, Florida, actually, you know, that was a race where for, mm -hmm. I think I think I think Democrats would have won Florida had they actually put forward a better candidate other than a Democratic socialist. That was a that was a bridge too far for a lot of people. But even even with that, it was it was really close. Um, so, you know, there but, are places where you can pull that type of candidate off, like in New York, for example. But right. I think Florida was the wrong, wrong time to try and nominate somebody. Right. And, you know, and Democrats, uh, Terry and I in the earlier segment, um, uh, Terry Schilling of American Princess Project, you know, he, he made the point and he gave props to Democrats because they actually, in a lot of House districts, actually recruited some decent candidates for that particular right. district. So that also contributed to, you know, especially you have uh, war veterans and things like that. Um, you know, it helps, it helps sharpen narrative. They don't look like they're this crazy far left. Um, you know, it, obviously like, uh, uh, Ocasio-Cortez couldn't win in like Kentucky six 
And Kentucky Six is actually that was a bellwether uh, district, and and I thought, oh, you know, I'm like the guy, you know, uh, Andy Barr won it. Well, that's a good sign, but he didn't win it by a wide margin, and that was kind of telling right. too about how the night was going to go. But again, she she was like saying, I want to be the most progressive person in Kentucky. Well, <laughs> that doesn't go over too well in Kentucky, no. you know. So. Um, yeah, back to I've Iowa. Appreciated, yeah, I've appreciated the theories being floated around about how uh, celebrity endorsements hurt rather than help this time around. Um, you know, well, at least in Tennessee it did. In Tennessee, Taylor Swift backing Marsha Blackburn's opposition. Uh, Beyonce uh, endorsed O'Rourke quite, quite heavily um, right before the election. So that's been amusing for me, a millennial, to, to watch the, yeah. um, you know, social media content come from that. I, I tell you what, though, um, that Texas Senate race has me concerned. Uh, I, I think I Democrats agree. are becoming more competitive. I think Beto was, Beto O'Rourke was a, a, you know, he's a dynamic, he was a dynamic candidate. He had a lot of money behind him, a lot, you know, um, a lot of attention. I don't honestly know why, but people like uh, because him. he can skateboard and because he's fine with cursing on stage you know the qualifications yeah. of a high school boy like right right well you know and i don't but then you look at the governor's race in texas and greg abbott won by a pretty large margin mm -hmm. so right uh, i think i think too there's the effect that you know crew uh, some trump supporters kind of you know stayed home from or not stayed home but maybe didn't vote or didn't vote in the Senate election and protest of Trump or of, of his mm -hmm. Cruz's, you know, uh, kind of uh, slight towards uh, President Trump during the uh, the Republican convention. You know, I thought by now that would have been water under the bridge, but I think there's something to that. I also think, to you know, Senator Cruz has been, I don't want to say polarizing, but well, the liberal would say, would say he's been polarizing. Even yeah. Even after, you know, I let you clearly know, but uh, not everybody listening knows I was on the Cruz campaign in 2016, and um, you know, it's it's he has been very polarizing as of late. But I think you're I think you're right where people who and it's no it's no secret that I don't <laughs> you know I'm not thrilled with Trump, but um, it is interesting how long memories remain when it comes to him particularly. Um, kind of not quite the same type of following as, you know, a Ron Paul or a Rand Paul, but it's own unique type of niche following that I, I think that that would be a good theory, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think, too, and, and this is something I thought about when Scott Walker lost his race, and then you saw Ted Cruz have, you know, his uh, race end up being so close. I think there's something to be said about running for president while you're still in office. It doesn't help. It does not help your political career after the fact if you don't win. Um, right. Because uh, I've not seen I, I've seen very few politicians do well at home after running unsuccessfully for president. Um, you know, Bobby Jindal probably, if he were running for another term in Louisiana, probably would have lost. Uh, and and actually, you know. Um, uh, Louis, uh, the current governor now is Democrat. So um, there's something to that. Texas, again, Texas is Texas. It's still pretty red. So Cruz had that going for him. Uh, but had it been more of a purple uh, state, I think he would have been toast. Um, so Right. I would be really curious. I mean, there's no good way of knowing this, but Project Veritas released some interesting um timely, you know, pieces of information about O'Rourke, about McCaskill, um, focusing in on a couple of different candidates. And I'd be really curious to see, you know, how, how highlighted those things were, um, you know, with McCaskill and it uh, detailing her, um, her affection for more gun control and um, O'Rourke talking about uh, use of campaign funds towards um, helping illegal immigrants, you know, in yeah. Texas. I, I would be curious to see what sort of uh, 11th hour impact that had. 
I mean, yeah. clearly not everybody is following along with that as much, but I did see some notable um, media mentions. I'll have to I'll have to troll around and see if uh, there was any exit polling in the Texas race. I'm not sure. So um, back to Iowa. It, uh, here's here's what I have to say about first the third congressional district in Iowa. Polk County went completely blue, um, and right. you could tell you could tell by some of the house races that, and even Dallas County. So the suburbs, for the most part, turned blue. Um, we lost Which is impressive. in the yeah in the Iowa House, uh, Iowa House District 38, which is basically you know southern part of Ankeny, um, and, and mm-hmm. unincorpor- unincorporated Pope County between Ankeny and and uh, and Des Moines. Uh, Kevin Kost- Kost- Kester lost his uh, reelection race to Heather Madsen, who was a pretty it was pretty you know. I think attractive candidate uh, for that district. Right. Um, I yeah, she, that was. I think personally for me, after working in the state house, that was one of the harder, harder results to stomach. Uh, him not being. Yeah. In oh, the, he's such in a. The house he's, such, he's he's such a nice guy. Um, and I, honestly, I think this might be a one just a one term blip. I I see a lot of these right. districts turn. I I see a lot of these districts going back. If if that's a huge if. Republicans and here's I think here's the key to Polk County, suburban women. Suburban women turned against the Republican Party. Um because right. you got again Johnston Grimes, Jake Heisel, uh House District thirty nine lost mm-hmm. in a race where a Republican shouldn't lose. Now House House District forty two of Peter County, I think that was always gonna be a difficult uh district to hold on to because that mm-hmm. that start, that was becoming more and more blue. And actually, I think Democrats outnumber Republicans in that district. So his loss to Kristen Sunday, who is a pretty good candidate for that district, just in terms of actual just a quality candidate in the way she campaigned, not necessarily policies. Her policies probably fit the district better than the counties does, however. Um, so you see that. But then also um, House District 43, which is Windsor Heights. Uh, that I think uh, nobody was surprised that turned because, you know, uh, Chris Hagenow, who actually ended up moving to a different house district in Dallas County, you know, safer district, um, house district 19 or 20, I can't remember exactly which one, but um, the he, I mean, he had he's had several elections where the the vote one, I remember one election, I can't remember what year, but he won the district by like eight votes. So it, that that right. one was that one was easy to see flipping because that Windsor Heights is is pretty blue. Um, House District 44, West Des Moines, Waukee. Again, mm-hmm. that should and honestly, it shocked me because uh, uh, Anna Bergman, uh, who I thought who was a, who was a Waukee City Council member, I thought would have had a good shot at that. Uh, but there must be. I'm assuming I, I'm not entirely familiar with the the politics involved there but you know there are, perhaps maybe people aren't satisfied with their, their role on the city council uh cause well we, we... something i was noticing last night just kind of um when i was watching some um how do i how do i phrase this when i was uh keeping up with some of my uh Polk county Democrats that I have as uh, Facebook friends and um, keeping up with, uh, they're rejoicing over those results. Uh, something I was noticing with some of the um, women who won those seats, and I think this is a, it's, it's very appealing to millennials, but they all had, um, they all kind of stood out professionally in a unique way. Um, one worked at the social club um, in Des Moines. Uh, several were professors um, where people, some of the people I was watching were commenting on saying, this is my professor. Uh, so I think that they, that was just a trend I wasn't necessarily expecting. Not only were they uh, female, you know, liberal female candidates, but they all kind of seemed to have this um, this trend of something something personally that would attract a millennial because unfortunately that's you know it's with a lot of my generation it's 
vote blue, right. it doesn't really matter, but then vote on anything other than, you know, actual policy. So yeah. I think that that, that couldn't have I, done anything that helped. I got to find out a little bit about how Sister 44, because that's still kind of a big what? <laughs> Because right. you know, again, a uh, female, you know, this is the year of the woman, uh, fe- Republican female running against a, a male candidate lost in a district where she was pretty well known, and maybe that was part of the problem. <laughs> you know, maybe she wasn't as good of a candidate as I thought. Obviously not; she lost. But going looking at these things, all this accumulate, all this builds up into the what happened to David Young. Um, when you have mm-hmm. all these these reliable Republican, except for forty two and and uh, uh, gosh, where is it? Looking for whatever whatever Hagenau's old seat was, except for those two that didn't surprise me flipping. I mean the, the, that should have been that should have been safe territory for Young, and that you know that that obviously impacted him as well. Also mm-hmm. too, comparing numbers looking at Dallas County for instance um, let's see well I think he young only won in I, I don't unfortunately I have it in front of me he only won Dallas County by like 3,000 votes he needed wow. he needed he needed to do better than that in Dallas County. He did better than that in 2014. There was like six, right. what's a six six. He had a, a margin of 2014 of six thousand between him and Stacey Apple. But in also in 2014, he only lost Polk County by two thousand votes, and he got trump. I mean, he got absolutely stomped in Polk County this year. And Polk County, and Polk County is the only county that Cindy Axney won in the district, uh, but it was such, right. by such a wide margin he couldn't overcome it. That's why he, he, I mean, he absolutely needed to do better than he did. I think uh, if he had uh, had he done had had he uh, picked up, you know, more more votes in in uh, Dallas County and and had a better margin in Polk County, I think this would have been a different story. He didn't. I but, think, uh, yeah, he, he, I think he, but he lost by you know twenty one thousand votes in Polk County. <laughs> you, right. can't, you, you can't do right. that. Yeah, exactly. I think a, a big rallying cry of election night was um, it was a lot of the twenty sixteen Trump supporters saying Iowa is a red state, and a lot of a lot of millennials, a lot of women, a lot of uh, liberal Iowans is just shouting back, no, we're not. Uh, and it just, I mean, sometimes I think we get too confident in uh, being able to hold Iowa when we forget that it's it's swamped. We're schizophrenic. And, yeah. <laughs> Iowa's schizophrenic when it comes to, um, when it comes to, you know, politics. Uh, we're, uh, I think for a while we were trending red and I still think we are pretty red. I mean, when you consider we won the governors and the right. race, and and the Iowa House held its Republican majority, they had a they, they lost uh, six. Let me look at my article I did on that. I want to say six seats. Yeah, they lost. It wasn't much, but yeah, they only Democrats only had a net gain of five, and they needed to have a net gain of ten to flip the Iowa House. Right. But then, but but then Republicans expanded their majority in the in the um in the Iowa Senate to the, from right. it was 28 to 20 to 38 to, or 32 to uh, 18 uh so they hmm. picked up four seats and they lost one uh, one of those seats was actually was originally a republican seat but it was held by state senator David Johnson who decided mm-hmm. to leave the republican party and then he realized he wasn't going to win re-election as a result of that so that was an easy Republican pickup, but um, yeah, uh, but uh, Republicans actually saw uh, some some women senators uh, or Senate candidates win as well. Carrie Kochler mm-hmm. uh, defeated Todd Bowman in Senate District 29. Chris uh, uh, Cornier, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing her name right, won in Iowa Senate District uh, 49, which was uh, State Senator Rita Hart's 
uh, seat that she didn't run in because she was running for lieutenant governor. I have to I have to say, you know, I told you so to a couple Democratic activists because when I said this is a potential Republican pickup, they were, they were like, oh, you're crazy, Shane. And I'm like, well, no, nope, I'm I telling you. will not miss Rita Hart. Will not miss Rita Hart. So what what did you think about uh, Iowa uh, Iowa District Four? Steve King. Oh man, it's been interesting to hear the buzz about Iowa District Four, which I mean, you can you can say whatever you want you, about uh, Congressman King. You you can you can throw things around. You can speculate, and I don't. I will say I don't agree with King um, as of late on a lot of what he says, but I think that um, people surprised by him winning underestimated how how aggravating uh, the constant um, media barrage of insults and undermining is. I think I, it was I, almost. I, I keep ahead. telling I, I keep telling people it's like is J.D. Shulton going to, you know, is he going to pull it out? Is he going to pull it out? I'm like, no, no. It, it is is no. impossible for a Democrat to win in that district. He's going to lose. Right. The only question is by how much. And obviously he had, he, this was Congressman King's closest race, I think, since he first won, you know, since he was first elected. I think that one was pretty close too. Uh, but the, yeah. the, we had redistricting then after that because uh, that was when he right. was, he first ran for Iowa Congressional District 5, which doesn't exist anymore. But, um, you know, he, right. he still, he, he, you know, he still lost by a pretty, uh, well, let me pull up. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was uh, do, 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 Iowa District 4. I want to say by three points. Well, let me double check that. Almost, well, yeah, three points, 50.33% to 46 Point nine six percent. He won it by almost eleven thousand votes, which for him that's a close race. Um, that is a close race. So it, it should have it should not have been that close. Um, I I will you know I think I think Republicans need to put a lot of pressure on Congressman King to kind of dial it down <laughs> uh, because I agree. you know he he said he he has said a number of things that. He, you know, there are a lot of tweets he doesn't need to do. There's a lot of, he doesn't, I don't know why he's doing foreign endorsements. Why? It I doesn't help that. It, it doesn't help them. It doesn't help him. There's no point in him doing that. So, you know, think, all these, you got all these unforced errors. Um, and, and honestly, if he were in any other district in Iowa, he'd be, he, you know, he'd be done. Right. I think um, something that comes into play, too, and I, I agree, uh, Congressman King's social media presence, um, I, I have about the same reaction to as uh, I do to Trump's social media presence. Um, there's just a lot that doesn't need to be said. Right. But I think um, Antonia Okafor's article at Caffeinated Thoughts uh, published oh. earlier, uh, so on Wednesday, since this is airing on Friday, I think she does an accurate job of explaining one of the reasons why King is able to hold on to that district. And it's that his, his in-person personality does not match, does not match what the media is saying. And it doesn't match even the, the front he is presenting on social media. Um, right. Now, are there consistencies in places? Yes, because that's his, you know, he's, he's talking about his own policies, but it doesn't match um, kind of the attitude that he comes he comes at things with on social media. And I think that that makes him a lot more personable to people in his district. Yeah. And I've, I've explained to some people too, I think sometimes he does uh, what he does on social media and in interviews to poke at the left. Um, so I think some of it's intentional uh, to, mm -hmm. to, to, you know, I, I personally, I'd rather see him shrink back, do fewer media hits, uh, have less of a social media presence and, and do more work on getting legislation passed. That that's yeah, what that I would personally be nice. rather that's what I would rather see. 
Um, I don't think he needs to be the uh, you know hitting the bully pulpit on on the decline of Western civilization. Even even though I I, 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 yeah. yeah, even though I, I agree with him on a lot of that, but I think he's not necessarily articulate on that issue. Also, too, and this is something I've I've explained to people. Some of his some of the um, policies that are not policies. Some of the things that he believes. Uh, regarding Western Civ, regarding immigration, put him in the same orbit as some white nationalists. Does that mean he's a white nationalist? Uh, you know, I don't think he is. I think he's not necessarily. He doesn't care for political correctness. Um, he, I think he's made some racially insensitive remarks. Um, but I re I've rejected people labeling him racist, basically because I know him, and I know he's not a racist. Right. So, right. And um, my my problem comes that word people we we throw that label around too easily. It's aggravating how powerless it's become because people toss it around too easily. I mean, for crying out loud, I was uh, I had posted something about how uh, one of my favorite things about Texas was that Beto wasn't its senator, <laughs> um, and posted uh, some pictures from when I was on the cruise campaign. And one of the first comments I received was a profanity-laced comment about how I must be so racist voting for Ted Cruz. Um, oh, my. Yeah, Ted Cruz the Cuban. <laughs> right, versus, versus O'Rourke, who, uh, you know, wants, wants to mislead as much as he possibly can about his ethnicity. But um, also, <laughs> you know, the, the, so just the, the throwing that around. And... I, you know, I, I probably am a little bit more cynical than, than you are towards King. I think he, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not advocating political correctness, but there certainly needs to be a little bit more of a compassionate oh. edge to what he's doing. And oh, I, I, wish I, I, think, I, I know you agree with, but. Yeah. Um, I, and he yeah, and I, and I think, we, we disagree on, on some immigration policy as well. I, I right. cornered him after a Republican event and told him I thought he was wrong on DACA. Um, as far as uh, as far as Congress passing DACA, I, he and I agree that the president doesn't have the authority to do it. But you know, I'm right. like, why don't you support this as as a member of Congress? Uh, this mm -hmm. because wh where else do we punish kids for the crimes of a parent? So, right. Um, Absolutely. So you know, he so we had a fruitful conversation on that. I mean, did he, did I change his mind? No, but he was willing to listen. Um, so. And, you know, I I heard something earlier today that I had to jot down, and that stuck with me. And I have a feeling it's going to be one of those uh, one of those comments that resonates in my brain for years and years and years. But um, I was listening to somebody dissect some policy issues, and they said something along the lines of, "You persuade with reason, you motivate with emotion." Yeah. And people people just they're they're trying to persuade with emotion <laughs> through uh through um you know their characterization of king and others um you know if you can if you can toss around highly charged words like you know white nationalist and you're a racist well um you know i, I think my first question to people is what do you mean <laughs> because I, right. i've run into a lot of millennials who um i think you know, very especially towards Kim Reynolds, I have seen um, seen some vulgarity written comments about how Kim Reynolds, is, you know, such a racist. Well, well, that'll be the, like, the G uh, version uh, here, but yeah, um, yeah, it's like and I'm like, what, what, what do you, yeah, what do you, you know, why I, that I don't even understand. You know, yeah, I don't she, know what, where, where they're coming what, from. What, it, what, yeah, what has she done that would make you even say that? Oh, because. Steve King was her, co you know, her campaign co-chair, so she's a racist because you think he's a racist. You know, even with Congressman King, back to him, with some of the stuff he, you know, I, I would encourage him, even if somebody disagrees with you on a policy that, you know, you agree with, try to check out their background first before you retweet them. And even if you uh, agree, right. Right. even if you agree and they're a white nationalist, don't give them a platform. You know, you shouldn't Absolutely. just give people a platform just because they agree with you. But I the think half the time people, well, I think a lot of times people assume that he knows the backgrounds of everybody he retweets. 
I don't think right. that's the case. I don't think and that's I mean, the case is, with Donald Trump does it either. Exactly. And this is almost reminiscent of the whole debacle where Kavanaugh didn't high five uh, the father of one of the shooting victims. It's like, well, right. if a person, you know what, you assume that he knows who that is. You assume, I mean, people forget that politicians are humans too. I mean, that's not, in this context, that's not me licensing anybody to say, you know, say things, but um, right. that's, they, they, I'm not necessarily going to know everybody who, and I've, I've done that before. I've retweeted somebody and then thought, hmm, I don't necessarily know them, clicked over to their profile and quickly have undone it because I've realized, you know, yeah. what, who they are and politicians Any, are no different. Yeah. Anymore. I, I don't, I try not to retweet anybody. I don't know who they are. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even if they say something I think is dead on, you know, I'll go check out them check them out a little bit first just because people are looking you know they're they're looking for stuff like that their social media has, has far you know has played so much more of an influence in how politicians are viewed than the, you know ever has been in the past but it, it, right it's just something they have to be careful about well hey kiddo we're <laughs> we're, we're going <laughs> on like 45 minutes so we should probably wrap it done any wrap it up any closing thoughts um well, kiddo, that's that's a great. <laughs> I'll hold on to that one. Well, you you are my kiddo. Are you not <laughs> okay, my daughter? True. true. It's refreshing being in Missouri and being able to introduce myself in the political world and not having okay. Well, oh, having <laughs> what? Yeah, no. Oh, you're not. Are you Shane Vanderhart's daughter? Exactly. Exactly. Not having that come out. And be like <laughs> down down there, I would be <laughs> Kelvy Vanderhart's dad. Absolutely, you would. Yeah, no, I'm able to actually show people my credentials and tell them, tell them what I'm up to and uh, not, hey, how's your dad? Not that I don't love you, but it's, it's nice to talk about, uh, you know, what I'm doing every once in a while. But uh, I think my closing, like, kind of, the, the thing that's been rattling around in my brain just with the media coverage and um, seeing, you know, seeing how people have responded, seeing what the results were. This certainly was a historical election for women, but it's been so disheartening. But I actually don't think people are recognizing that it was a historical election for women. I think people are recognizing that it was a a very good front for their own ideology. Because yeah. for Republican women, it was an amazing night, but I have seen so little coverage about that. I mean, Kim Reynolds first, here in Iowa, first elected female governor. And now mm -hmm. across the country, it's been like that. And so I think it's it's honestly laughable that so many people think that they're reporting on the, you know, this historical election for women when they're really just reporting on one simple facet of it and trying to label it as, you know, look, look at this. So I think it just shows um, a lot of the, a lot of the just, one thing a really um one thing to be able to promote how diverse they are on the left um which yes it was a historical election for women all around i mean native american women you had young kim uh first korean american woman um but <laughs> young kim's name is not being used in the media practically at all whereas you know you have this laundry list of people on the left so that's been disheartening, but um, yeah. thankfully, people, conservative women, still won seats and are reminding people that yes, there there's a huge portion of the country that of women who are conservatives and libertarians because you know all issues are women's issues and we're we we can think for ourselves. We don't need the left to tell us how to do that. And um, so I think those results show. So it's just. I wish people would not, you know, comment on them, but so goes being a, being a conservatarian woman. But those were, uh, that was, I think, my main kind of yep. thought from last night. Okay. Well, hey, I'm going to let you go because we've been talking for a long time. But thank you so much for chatting with me. Absolutely. All right. And that concludes today's episode of the Caffeinated Thoughts Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you happen to be listening to this podcast somewhere other than on our website, please be sure to check out caffeinatedthoughts.com. That's caffeinated, C-A-F-F-E-I-N-A-T-E-D 
thoughts.com. You could just Google caffeinated thoughts and it'll show up at the top of your search screen. Also, you can you can subscribe to this podcast using one of your favorite podcast apps, be it Stitcher, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, SoundCloud, who am I missing? Spotify. Uh, so if there's one that we're missing, uh, be sure to drop me a line, Shane at caffeinatedthoughts.com, and, and let me know, and we'll see about what we could do uh, to get that that uh, our podcast on that app as well. So um, also be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, sign up for emails. That way you don't miss a single update. Hey, this is Shane Vanderhart, and until next time, my friends, take care. Take care.